Thank you so much. It oh, brings back so many memories coming back here. And uh, Ruth, you're just getting better. I think the, the anointing of God is just there, richer and deeper. Um, I was here many, many years ago. How many remember? How many were there when I came? Yes, I know there was only a few. <laughs> but um, uh, I have a, I owe actually your pastors, Peter and Dawn, a great debt <laughs> because they were among the very first when I first came back from the mission field that actually believed that I had <laughs> a viable ministry in the family and gave me their pulpit. Um, just to give you a little introduction, I'm a missionary kid. My parents were missionaries in Bolivia, in South America, but my, I'm originally of Italian descent, though I lost my mother when I was very young. She died in Bolivia in a car accident. My father remarried an American uh, Dutch, so I have a bit of an, an accent, I know. But um, while growing up in Bolivia, around the age of 12, the Lord called me to be a full-time servant of God and to be, to be a missionary. And so when I was 18, I went to Bible college in Texas, and uh, between my third and fourth year, they sent me to Paraguay to do missions internship in the country of Paraguay, which is, if you know that part of geography, it's right next to Bolivia, but I had never been in Paraguay. It's a tropical country. And I landed in Paraguay, and the missionary said, <clears throat> the one that was going to take care of me, he said, wait till you meet the Australian. I thought, Australian? There's an Australian in town? And he said, yes, an Australian. He's good looking, too, and he's single. And I thought, whoa, Australian. I'm thinking in my head, geography, you know, that, that was Austria. I know Austria's next to Italy. So what's Australia? Where's Australia? Australia's on the other side of the globe, way over here. And I thought, wow, Australia. I had seen Australia once in a National Geographic magazine, and they had kangaroos in a golf, club, in a golf course, uh, you know, running around. And then they had also a little picture of the Tasmanian devil which I thought was not a very pretty animal. <laughs> and that's about all I knew about Australia. So I remember asking the missionary, what language does he speak? And they said, we think it's English. <laughs> but we're constantly asking him, what, what? <laughs> and so that's where I met my husband. So I'd like to say that I married the first Australian I ever met. <clears throat> and how wonderful it was that his last name was Grace. Because when I first got married and I first wrote my name as Erica Grace, I felt like God was saying, you don't know my, my background, but one day I might tell you, I needed grace. I just needed grace. And he said, I put it in your name. So that every time you write your name, you remember it's all by grace. Yeah. And so I thought, oh, thank you, Lord. It's been so good. But I'm here today because I have a message. And the message has come to me, <clears throat> actually in 1982, the first time it came to me, when uh, Chris and I, my husband Chris, actually by the way he sends his regards, he would have loved to have been here, Peter, and uh, he's, he's preaching in a Singaporean church. And um, actually we uh, left, we were pastoring a church in Worriallet for six years. But we really felt once our kids graduated from school and uh, Chris's mom passed away, we were freer. We really missed um, cultural people and cultural diversity. So we turned the church over to somebody else and we went. Now we're totally itinerant and we are ministering mainly among our monocultural churches because among our denomination the 40 percent of our churches are monoculture that means they're african singaporean yesterday i was with a filipino group and they're just just one culture and we're having a ball because every every week we have a different cultural experience and uh, we love them all and they're all very different and god has made a wonderful variety 
and they're all God's children. And thank God he's bringing so many people to Australia because every church we go to in their schedule for the week, there's one day for fasting and praying for Australia. They love Australia with a passion. They're very concerned for Australia and they pray for us so much. So we always give thanks to God. So going back to the message that God gave me in 1982, Chris and I were missionaries in Bolivia and we were sent to a place to start a Bible school. We're Bible school teachers. And Chris was going to be the director. The buildings were built, but nobody had come to teach. And uh, I was everything else because I was the only one that could type. You know, back then, we didn't have computers. We didn't have fax machines. We didn't have photocopiers. We didn't have any of that. We had to do everything the old way. To make a test, you had to type on a stencil. And then you had to run the stencil on an ink machine to make copies. Oh. So I thank the Lord for computers anyway. <coughs> One um, friend that I had befriended in Australia a couple of years before when we were here had asked me what she could send me when we had returned to the mission field. And I said, you know, I really need Tupperware um, because in Bolivia we have so many little grubs and they get into our flour and our sugar and everything and I'm sick and tired of having to sift every little bit of everything. So she sent me Tupperware <coughs> and in that paper, in that uh, package of Tupperware, she also put in the latest newspaper. Because she knew that there, in Bolivia we never heard any news about Australia. And it was 1982. Now you may not remember this, but 1982 Princess Diana was going to have a baby. Because I remember the newspaper was full of it. You know, she's expecting and there was, every page was something about her, pictures of her. And one little article caught my attention. It was almost hidden between all the other articles. Just a small article. It said, the witches are having a conference in Australia. And I thought, wow. I grew up in a Christian home, so I thought, I couldn't believe witches existed. But, and the most incredible thing was that they were so organized as to have conferences. I thought, like, well, this is amazing. And so I kept reading. And then the final statement just absolutely gobsmacked me. It said, the theme of the conference is the destruction of the family nucleus. So they were going to, I don't know, I hate to use the word pray, but they were going to ask Satan <coughs> and his demons to destroy the family nucleus. That's what they were getting together for. And when I read that, I felt like a bolt of lightning, a bolt from heaven just hit me, just zapped me. <clears throat> and I just felt the presence of God in my body so strongly. I felt like I was standing on hot, burning coals, and my hair was on fire. And I began to weep. I couldn't help it. And I said, oh, God, you can't allow this to happen. And it was as if he was inside my ear. He said, what are you going to do about it, Erica? I thought, oh, what can I do? I said, God, don't you remember me? I'm the one that cried herself to sleep all my life. I said, Lord, I'm just a teacher. And he said, well, teach. Teach. And he said, if you were going to fight the devil, and his demons, this is the only book that you can use to win. You can't beat Satan with intellect. You can't beat Satan with an education. Good on you if you have one, but you can, that's not going to beat him. This is the only wep weapon that God has given us to do the warfare with Satan, to really win when he comes and battles against you. And so that's why today I'm here, because I know there's a special warfare being unleashed like never before. It's all in a, it's furious, in a furious space like never before, because I know that the devil knows his time is, is short. He knows his time is short. And so he's unleashed hordes of his armies to do battle. And in one area in which he's doing the worst damage, of course, is in the area of marriage. He's 
He's already had many victories there. We have allowed many laws to pass through this country without batting an eye. We have allowed to, you know, yeah, no fault divorce. Oh, yeah. Was that being passed in Parliament? Oh, well, okay, yeah, well, that's, that's all right, you know. It just passed just like that. The abortion laws in Australia passed because 18 people came to vote. Nobody stood up to say, this is disgusting. How can we be killing babies at full term? This is outrageous. Do we, are we really thinking that God's going to let us, you know, go with, uh, through with this? This is... The worst laws in the world are in Victoria. And you know, the warfare is fully on. And so I'm here to just remind you and to sound a warning because I know that I have been called to the church to remind Christians, to remind brothers and sisters to be on the lookout, to be very, very, very aware that right now, right now, Satan has his darts attacking your home. And, uh, but you have greater power because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So today what I really want to do is bring to you a most foundational message. It's like the foundation of all of marriage. What did God have in mind when he created marriage? Because today we're being called in Australia to redefine marriage. And people are trying to look at the, well, you know, marriage was made up because, the, because of social laws or because of economic laws, and it, was, it started 400 years ago. No, it started, no, 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 no. Let's go back to the origin of marriage. And for that, I invite you to open your Bibles in Genesis chapter 2, because that gives us the real origin of where it all began. Genesis chapter 2, we're going to start with verse... 7, I'm going to read 7 to 9, and then we're going to skip. I'm reading with the, on the New Living Translation. Man. Verse 7, Then the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils, and the man became a living person. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man that he had made. So we'll skip to verse 15. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord God warned him, You may freely eat of every tree in the garden, except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, It's not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. So the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the sky and all the wild animals, but still there was no helper just right for him. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into deep sleep, and while the man slept, the Lord God took out of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. And the Lord God made a woman from the rib, and he brought her to the man. At last, the man exclaimed, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And she will be called woman because she was taken from the man. And this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. Now the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the anointing of your word. And I thank you that your word is always anointed. I thank you for the authority that it carries. And I thank you that today it will speak to every heart that is open. And I pray that it will bear fruit. And I pray that every interference of the enemy will be squashed and void. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. I love creation. I love the fact that um, we can find out here how God made us and how God made man. The origin of everything, of course, the meaning of everything is tied up in its origin. If you want to know how anything is supposed to work, you need to look at its origin. 
And now we're going to find out how marriage is to work because that's the origin. But before we go in there, I just want to show you one little, little subtle way in which the enemy has tried, has tried to already um, put his uh, insidiously destroy the work that God has made. His tool, his favorite tool, is called evolution. You've learned it. I've learned it. Our kids are learning it. This is science. No one ever tells you it's just a theory. You know what a theory is? A theory is just ideas, but it hasn't been actually, it's, it's not actually fact. It's a theory. It's somebody's idea. And I love to really make fun of them because if you look at, at evolutionist books, they'll start with 7 billion. Oh, no, it's 12 billion. No, it's 300 billion. No, it's 200 billion. And I just love to say, oh, really? Let me just get another figure because I have a long notebook where I've written down the different figures because it's a theory. Nobody can know that. And so they teach it to our t children as if it's fact. But Satan very cleverly has given us is given a whole generation through evolution a distorted view of the world, a totally distorted worldview, because there is a creation, but there is no creator. Therefore, man is just as important as animals. In fact, if it, in some cases, if the animal is suffering more than the human, the human has to die so the animal can live. Human life, therefore, becomes less valuable. That's why when you talk to an ev evolutionist, they can't understand why ab abortion is a bad thing. They think it makes sense. You don't want that, baby. Human life has no value. Euthanasia is absolutely sensible. That person doesn't want to live anymore. We don't want him to live anymore. He's, you know, we're spending all our inheritance keeping him in this bed. So it makes sense. Of course, when you're an evolutionist, there's no eternity because you were born by chance and you will die and that will be the end of it. So there's no purpose in your life. You were born for, by chance and you will die and nothing will happen afterwards. That's the end of that. So there's no eternity and there's no accountability. And I say, what a pathetic, sad way of teaching people about life. You were born without a purpose. Isn't that ridiculous? That just, that just totally deflates you. No wonder people are depressed. I have no purpose in life. When the gospel and the word of God is totally contrary. You were born with a purpose in life. God knew you before you were, before even the world was made. And you know what? He saw you when you were being formed in your mother's womb. It's just so precious. I hope I haven't ruined anything. So, that's Satan's attempt to erase God, but we know better. Now, I love this fact that it tells us how God made man. Because in the first chapter of Genesis, we see that God is creating the universe by just speaking, isn't he? He says, let there be light. And I would have loved to have seen him go, come on, come on, show him this light, wow. Then he said, let there be luminaries in the sky. All the stars came out. Ah, oh, oh, that must have been amazing. Then he said, yeah, okay, we're going to separate the waters from the, from the dry land. So the water, you can't go any further than this. The water. Everything was done with his word. But when it came to the man, he formed him. That means he used his hands. That means the man was... A special creation. And I can see God, you know, I think he uses robes. I don't know, maybe probably he doesn't, but I would just like to see him putting up his sleeves and getting his hands dirty, getting his hands down on the dirt that God created. Do you know that God created the dirt? Man can't, can't even create dirt. <laughs> that dirt that we sweep out of our house and everything, God created the dirt. That amazing. I, I just get amazed. And he, he formed a man out of this dirt that he made, you know, two arms, 
equal length, two legs, just right, equal length, you know. <laughs> and the head, not too big, you know, don't make him big-headed. Just, just right, a big, a big enough head. And, um, you know, it's a good thing that inside our head, it's, it's hollow. I mean, there's, it's not all bone, isn't it? The brain is in there, but it's not. If it was all bone, it would be very heavy. <laughs> But uh, he made all the internal organs. Oh, he must have had so much fun creating this, forming this man, forming the man. And then he said, even as he was formed, the man was not alive until God made those holes up his nose and he <sighs> breathed the breath of God and the man became a living being. <sighs> So we say the breath of God is what gives us life. We're all descendants of Adam and Eve. And that, that initial breath that gave life for all of us to live came from God. It's God's breath. And it's more than just lungs breathing. With that breath came so many things. Came. It, that gave us a spirit and a soul and a conscience and a personality and a will, and the, the fact that we can have intelligence, and that we can have communication, and oh, it, and, and he put eternity in our hearts. Oh, that breath of God just absolutely gave him full life. And so Adam became alive. And, um, you know, this is different than the way God made animals. And this is why we're allowed to eat them. <laughs> we can eat animals. because They don't have all this that man has. And of course we know that man was made in the image of God. Now it's interesting, of course, that God puts the man in the garden and he gives him a task. That's always good. Man needs a task. Man needs a work. Man needs something to do. We all know that. that that's good. And God was saying that everything he created, he saw that he was good except for one thing. He saw that man, it was not good for man to be alone. Oh, I've got to hear an amen on that. All the men. It's not good for men to be alone, isn't it? Amen. <laughs> Some are saying, I'm not saying that in front of my wife. <laughs> it's not good for man to be alone. Amen. No, sir. thank you, Peter. I know you know that's true. So actually, even though God made all the animals parade in front of Adam, Adam could see that none of them was made for him. There was nobody like him. And so the special creation and the special unique creation had to, had to begin. And you know, the woman was a necessary creation. The woman was a necessary creation. And that woman was the only part of creation that God made specifically for the man. Now, wouldn't that go well in a feminist rally? Oh, yes. Um, but the, the wonderful thing about how God made the woman, and, it, and when he says here that the Lord God, in verse 21, the Lord God caused the man to fall into deep sleep. <laughs> Why is it that men sleep so deeply? I just, I just, I'm so jealous, you know. My husband sleeps like a log. Anyway, while the man slept, the Lord God took out of the man's rib. He took out of the man's ribs and closed up the opening. And then the Lord God made a woman. That word made in English is a very poor word, made. He just made. But in the original is he fashioned her. It's a very sophisticated word. It's like a very sophisticated, intricate thing that he was building up. You know, it's a, it's a very sophisticated word. It's a very, um, a more intricate word, even than the, the word that he used for man. But he didn't use more dirt. I mean, he had the whole earth full of dirt. He could have said, oh, I'll just take another pile of dirt and, uh, and make her. No, no, no. He opened up Adam. He took out of Adam a rib. 
blood flesh from him because she he wanted to give us a very important lesson of what he had in mind for us to learn what he had in mind for marriage and um, it was very deep and symbolic the giving the man heavenly anesthesia <laughs> making him fall asleep and taking out the rib it's interesting that the rib is the one part of your body that will regenerate. If you ever break it or lose it or somehow have an accident, it'll grow back. God didn't want to deform Adam. You know, he didn't want to take a leg and then Adam would have to go, you know, hopping around. No, he didn't want to deform him. So it was from inside of him. He took from inside of him and then he closed him up. A very heavenly operation. And um, I like the fact that he didn't take from Adam's head because Eve was, the woman was never meant to rule over the man. But he didn't take her from his feet either because she was never meant to be his servant or his slave. He took her from his side because she was always meant to be his equal. And he took her from under his arm to be protected and from near his heart to be loved. Isn't God romantic? I think he is. I think he loves it when we find these little things and it touches us. The rib, the rib cage protects the heart. It's the closest thing to the heart. And I, I think a wife needs to know that um, a wife, you, you as a wife, are the closest thing to your husband's heart. And uh, that should also come with an amber light that says, just tread carefully. Because you have the power to, you know, crush that heart. But you also have the power to protect that heart. And then he brought her to the man, it says. I love that. He brought her to the man. Isn't that lovely? Oh, God. He was, a, he was a wonderful matchmaker. He says, Adam, wake up, Adam. i got something to show you. Wake up. You won't believe what you're going to see. And he woke up, and I love this version because he says, at last. Oh. <laughs> in other versions, it doesn't say that. But in this one, it says, at last, this one, this one is like me. This one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh and she will be called a woman. I love that because God is a perfect matchmaker. I try to remind my son, Andrew. My oldest son is not married yet. I said, he's a per perfect matchmaker. She'll be worth it. She'll be worth it. Just keep waiting. <laughs> he does bring people together. He brought an Australian all the way to Paraguay to meet me. I think he can bring somebody for you if you're looking for somebody. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Eve was pretty? She was, if Adam was the epitome of all creation, he was the, the star, she must have also been equally. But let me ask you a question. Do you think she was white? Have you ever thought of that? <laughs> we love creation science. We love, uh, fascinated by creation science. And we have many Christian scientists, believe it or not. Uh, of course you did, you know that. And uh, they have found through DNA and um, their research that neither Adam nor Eve could have been white. Because within the first couple from which we all descend, there would have to be the, enough melanin to have all the different skin colors that we see today. If Adam and Eve would have been white, we'd all be white. The whole world would be white. There would be no other colors. But because they inside them, they had to have enough melanin of, to be able to go darker or lighter. So they were right in the middle. A nice color latte, brown. <laughs> uh, so there you go. But you know, the fact that we were made at different times and at di with different elements 
And, and I like to remind my husband that there's no dust on me, okay? I'm not dust. You're the dusty one. <laughs> um, different times, different elements, different uh, ways and method in which we were made shows that we are different. We are different. God made us different. We're equal, but we're not identical. And a lot of times you hear out there in the feminist world that we want, demand equality. What they really say, are saying is we demand identical. We want to be identical. But you cannot be identical. God made us different. And those differences are intrinsic. That means they're inside of us. We can't help it. <laughs> we're born like that. We're, we're made different. And that's why we're called the opposite sex. We are opposites. And I love the verse in Proverbs that says, the man who finds a wife finds a treasure. Marriage was never intended to make us suffer or to be a headache. It was a, a gift from God. And he receives favor from God. It's uh, God is interested in being part of our marriage. Sometimes we come to church to get married and then we leave God here and go on and have our marriage. But he wants to come along with you and be part of every day of your marriage. Now, there's two reasons why she was made. First of all, when God said, you know, it's not good for man to be alone, God made the woman for her to be a companion to the man. And it does us good as women to be reminded that that's the reason God made us, to be his companion. What is a companion? One that keeps company, one that shares in the work, pleasures, misfortunes. It's the friendly be feeling of being together, of sharing. It's a friendly feeling of being, of having fellowship. You know, this means that among seven billion people that live in this world, your life has meaning to somebody. Somebody actually misses you when you're not there. <laughs> Somebody is happy to see you come home or to be, next, to, to be sitting next to you. You mean something to somebody. And let's not underestimate the powerful um, meaning of, of having a companion because loneliness is the number one reason men commit suicide. It is not good for men to be alone. They get in all sorts of trouble. They do all sorts of bad things. They start drinking. They just go off the rails. It's not good for men to be alone. He needs a companion. And uh, let's not underestimate that. We are social beings, and that's why God made us. And then the second reason why God made her was when he said, I will make him a helper who is just right. You know, we may say, again, I say English. I'm sorry, English is not my first language, as you can tell. But English is a very poor language because we have such few words to mean so, so many things, like the word love, you know, I love... I love spaghetti, and I love the color red, and I love God, and I love my children, but I also love um, Kim Walker, and you know, you just sort of love everything, but it's, it's got different meanings for each one, but it's one word, and so in, in English also it's helper, but it's, it's not a, a good enough word because it's been belittled. We say, oh, she's just a help. She's just a help. No, no, it's a very strong word. It's a very strong word. You know, it's almost, like a, it's almost like a military word. It means a liberator, <laughs> a rescuer, an ally, one that is of equal strength, that will come and save you. Because the word helper is found 17 times in the Bible. 13 times it's for God. It's in the verse that says, the Lord is my helper. Does that mean that God is coming to do just a menial little thing? No, he's coming to rescue me. That's how strong that word is. 13, so 17 times in the Bible, 13 times to God, 
two times for wives and three times and two times for pastors that were helping out. So it's a very strong word that it's a word mostly given to God. It's also given to the woman. She is the helper. She's come to rescue you. You know, if you only think that your wife is only good for one thing, and it's, you can't see in her how much she can really help you, you really haven't tapped into the resources that God has given her. Because the woman has many talents that God has put in her to help you. To help you. Just yesterday I was talking to a, a lady who was telling me that they lost their business because she was, uh, she was much better at finances than he was. But he couldn't uh, accept the fact that his wife was smarter than him. <laughs> and so even though she gave him all the right advice and kept saying, don't sell now, don't sell now, we won't sell now, on top. she kept all, she did all the taxes, she did all the, all the papers all those years, and, uh, and so he went ahead and he, he said, I am sick and tired of you telling me what to do. You know, you're telling me what to do. And so I'm going to go ahead. And he sold, and he sold at a loss. And it, the whole thing, now they're about to, sell, to lose the house. And she was opening her heart to me. And she, she, you know, she, it broke my heart when she said, she could, he could not understand that we're on the same team. What's the competition? We're not competing. Did we get married to compete? No. We got married to work together, to be a team. If she's better with finances, hallelujah for you. It's off your back. In my house, I'm no good with finances. I just say to Chris, is there any money? He says, not this week. Okay, that's fine. Don't bore me with taxes. I don't know. I don't want to know. He does all that. But whoever is the best one. That's the one who we should do it. We work together. We work together. And see, she, met, she was made a helper just right for him. I could never have married a farmer. I wouldn't have been able to help him. Really, seriously. I, can't, I don't know which one is a weed and which one is a plant. It's just like, you know, that. I, lo I looked at somebody. Somebody had all this... Thing planted. I said, aren't they nice ferns? And she says, they're carrots. And I thought, like, what? <laughs> I didn't know that carrots had such big things coming out of the ground. So you see, I wasn't right for that. But I was just right for a minister. <laughs> oh, dear. So she can do for you a lot more than cooking. Be smart, man. Be smart. She's got intuition. A wise husband listens to his wife. And he, does, she doesn't have, he doesn't have to do everything he tells her. Don't let her boss you around. But listen, because you can see only black and white, but she's seeing in color. And you can only see things when they knock you on the head. <laughs> but she can see the vibes. You know? Maybe one day we'll talk about differences. But they're there for a reason. And when a woman has an intuition, you better pay attention. Verse 24, now this gives us the foundation for marriage. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother. The reason that in the woman he's going to find a companion and a helper is the reason why he can leave his father and mother. And he no longer needs to find the companionship and and help in, within his family. He's going to find it in her. And it's joined to his wife. This join, the word join, is, is such a, a strong word. It means to unite. It means to make out of two, one. It means to bring together to form a single unit. It means to cause to adhere to cling together. It's a very unique union. You don't have this with your parents. 
You don't have this with your mother or your father. You don't have this with your siblings nor your friends. This is a very unique union and singular union. You don't have this with anybody else. And then it says the two are joined together. He's joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. The shall become is a continuous verb. It's what it's verb. It, it should actually be in English. And the two will be, will be ongoing becoming one. Ongoing. It's an ongoing thing. You know, I thought the day I got married, we were going to be one and that was it. No. It just keeps on going. It keeps on going. Every year you become more one, more one, more one. We celebrated 38 years of marriage. And I can tell you, it, you're just more one. You know, now, now it's just like marriage is so easy. Because, you know, we just have to look at each other and we go, oh, what's happened? You know? <laughs> and I always try to give Chris a a surprise part, birthday party, but I can't because he looks at me and he goes, what are you up to? And I, he can just, you can read each other, can't you, Peter? Yes. You can read each other. You can see just by the way he's walking, whether his shoulder is down, you go, oh, something's happened. Or his shoulder's up, oh, good news are coming. Or just that hes hesitation of, a, of an answer. What, what do you really mean? You already know. It's just, Stick with it, young people, young people that are married for a short time. Stick with it because it keeps getting better. You keep going, you keep getting one, becoming one, always more one, and it just becomes uh, much easier. And you know, love keeps growing. Love at 20 is different than love at 30, and then love at 40 is different again, and then love at 50 just becomes different again. And I'll just leave it there. Um, and then that word one, they shall become one, one, one. Let's not be independent. Oh, the English independent spirit. I want to be independent. I don't want this husband to look after me. I want to be independent. No, 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 no. You can be independent from everybody else, but in your marriage, you're one, one, one. That word one is the same word that's used for the Trinity. The Lord, the God, is one. One body, one spirit, one word, one faith, one baptism, one God, one, 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 one. And in kingdom mathematics, one man plus one woman equals one. You know, one man plus one man equals two men. One woman plus one woman equals two women. But one man and one woman equals one. One. So let me define oneness. It's the integration of two beings. They come from different backgrounds. They have had different experiences. But they come together agreeing to meet each other's needs for love and companionship. This is what you do on purpose. You actively engage in mutual acceptance. Stop trying to change each other. You mutually accept each other. You actively desire to complete one another. Here, you can't do that. I'll do that. I'll do that. I'll hold that. I'll do that. You know, um, we complete each other. Chris last night was saying, now, do you know how to get to, get to the Owens Church? And I said, oh, yes, I remember. He said, how would you do it? I said, I think I go down Manchester Road, and then I, turn, I just go straight, and then it, no, no, no. He says, you've forgotten. I said, really? I, I just go down Manchester, and then I cross at Churnside Park, and then I just go straight. I go, no, no, no. And so, you know, he, he completes me. He's always making sure... Because he knows that when people talk, you know, men and women talk about directions in different ways. I was leaving a church and the pastor was saying, now sister, from this place you go north three kilometers and then you turn east 
And then you go, and I'm thinking, is, is he speaking English? <laughs> How would I know what North is? Don't talk to me like that. And his wife could tell, and she says, you know that big McDonald's and over there, with, with, and there's also a, a spotlight? Yeah, I just turned right there. Oh, see, that's, that's my language. So <laughs> we complete each other. So last night he was showing me I was totally wrong. I had really com forgotten how to get here. But uh, he, he helped me. And to have the will to strengthen, to minister and nurture and encourage. I don't want anybody else nurturing my husband. If anybody's going to nurture my husband, it's me. And I'm sure you feel the same way. You don't want somebody else to be nurturing your wife. And you don't want somebody else to be nurturing your husband. You've got to do it. Encourage them. Respond to them. Pray for them. If you're not praying for your spouse, who is? You know, people tell you, I'll be praying for you. Well, I don't know. Thank you, but will they? I don't know. But I will be praying for my spouse, and he prays for me. And also to allow the atmosphere where you can be completely open and honest. You know, the first couple, they didn't even know they were naked. They didn't even know nakedness. They didn't know anything else. They felt no shame. And today, of course, because sin has entered the world, we know. But in that marriage, when we come together, in that intimacy, this is not something you do with everybody else, it's that intimacy of your marriage. You need to allow the atmosphere where you can be so completely bare. You bear your soul. You can be completely honest without fear of being shamed, belittled, ridiculed, or, or made to feel shame. You're safe. You need to know that here in this intimacy of your marriage, whatever you say is safe. It's safe. This is where you're allowed, you can even boast here. Or you can even be vulnerable here. But it's safe in that intimacy. David Edwards is somebody that wrote a, uh, a quote that I really like very much. He said, there's four things that contribute to some degree to a good marriage. Walk hand in hand. See eye to eye. Talk face to face. And kneel side by side. I love that because I found that it's true in my marriage. You have to walk hand in hand. You know what that means? Sometimes people don't hold hands. I like holding my husband's hand, but some, some people don't. But what it really means is don't be so far apart that you, you're <laughs> too far out of each other's reach. You know, some people have such lives that they, they just are like two ships in the night. They just sort of meet at, at breakfast table or something, little notes. Pick up the children at three. Pick up the dry cleaning at five. I'll see you tomorrow. You know, it's just like they're two ships. They're going different directions. You got to walk hand in hand. Hand in hand. That means close enough to be able to walk together. You're walking towards the same direction and you're walking close, close together. You've got to see eye to eye. You know, in everything we do, we're equal partners. We've got to talk things through until we can see eye to eye. We're going to agree. And if we can't agree, we're going to take it to the Lord in prayer to show us why we can't agree. But we're going to, everything we do, we're going to do it in agreement. It's not my life and your life. I don't come home and I say to Chris, I bought a Jeep. And he goes, what? You bought a Jeep? Yeah, I just bought a Jeep. How's that? You know, we, we have to agree before we do things like that. We agree. We have to be in agreement before we're going to buy a Jeep. <laughs> before we're going to do anything, we're in agreement. See eye to eye. 
talk face to face. You know, that speaks of this is one relationship where you cannot afford to be dishonest. You have to be really honest. Now choose your words wisely and do it with love, but honesty, face to face, and you can speak to each other's face and be totally and completely honest. And kneel side by side. You know, that really gets to me. Why is it that couples leave prayer for the last recourse? We speak to many couples many times, and try to counsel them, and the first question we ask them is, have you been praying for one another? And they go, well, uh, no, not really. And I'm going, what is wrong with you? Prayer is so powerful. Prayer is so powerful. It is so powerful. It is so uniting, so binding. Don't leave it until it's the very last recourse. Start praying every day. It, it benefits you when you pray for your husband. Say, God, give my husband wisdom. Give him strength. Make him strong. Give him favor, a good job. Give him good health. Lord, we, I need him to live for a long time. <laughs> so, Lord, uh, give him, you know, just give him maturity and give him your wisdom. And it benefits the husband when he can pray for his wife. He says, Lord, give my wife wisdom. Make her strong. Make her uh, have, give the joy of the Lord in her heart. Make her, Lord, the woman you want her to be. It benefits us when we pray for one another. And, um, you know, Satan will do anything to keep us from praying. Anything. Oh, he just loves, he just loves to interrupt your prayer. You're going to start to pray? Oh, make sure the phone's ringing. You have to make sure the, you know, the kettle's boiling. Some, oh, you just thought of something, didn't you? So you've got to go and then you postpone, you postpone, you postpone, you postpone. You've got to determine in your heart that you will pray. Actually, one funny thing, I'll say this, and then I'm sure I'm supposed to finish. Um, the cultural churches were getting together, and they were going to have an end-of-year get-together last year. And so they were showing the, the schedule to the, our state leader, who's an Aussie, of course. And they, said they had from 2 to 6 prayer. Then at 6, we're going to start to worship until 7. And then at 7, we're going to have the message. And then at 8, we were going to have a banquet. <laughs> and our, our state director, he says, two to four, two to six prayer, far out. He says, <laughs> how do you get your people to pray that long? And they go, well, should we make it longer? They go, <laughs> he says, no, I'm just amazed. But prayer has to be a part, a very uh, natural part of our life. It's talking to God. Yeah. You're talking to God. What an awesome privilege. <laughs> what an awesome privilege to be able to speak with him and listen to him. So that's the origin of marriage. The origin of marriage was in the mind of God. And because he originated marriage, he gets to write the instructions, and the instructions are here. This book has instructions on how to stay married how to keep loving each other, how to raise children, how to communicate, how to live a long life, how to treat your in-laws. It's got everything in here. Everything, everything, everything is in here. And you know, God made marriage before there was even parenthood or before, before there was government, before there was church. God made the woman before she even was a housekeeper or a homemaker. <laughs> there was no home to keep. So this is where go the origin of marriage started. And in Australia, they want us to redefine marriage. You know what we need to tell them? It's too late. Marriage already has its definition. It's between a man and a woman until death do us part. And that's what the Lord had in mind. You know, no other success can compensate for failure in the home. Shall we pray? Lord, I thank you today 
for your wonderful word. I thank you that you reminded us today of how you made man so wonderfully, Lord. You took time. You used your hands. You did it with so much love. And then how you fashioned the woman. Oh, so sophisticated in such a sophisticated way, such an intricate way, just to meet the man's needs. And Father, today we just want to thank you for the wonderful blessing that is marriage. We know the world has belittled it. We know the world has sullied it, has made it uh, um, something that we can live without, has made us think that it's not as precious as it is. But Lord, today we recognize it is a masterpiece so that we don't have to live our lives alone. And Father, we pray today that we would have opportunity to speak up for marriage in our work, wherever we go, that we may say, I believe in marriage. Marriage is a gift of God, and we can work at it. And marriage can be the happiest journey of your life, of our life. And I thank you for those that are enjoying a happy marriage. I thank you for those that are a wonderful testimony of the beautiful work it is to walk through life with somebody that loves you and that somebody that you can love. And Father, I pray for each and every marriage that is here represented today, that you would bless them, that you would encourage them, that you would show them that there is a really wonderful way to have a great marriage, and that's when Jesus is part of it, and the Word of God is part of it. Father, I just dedicate these marriages, these families to your care. Bless them, help them, and I pray that your word will, will have fruit in the days to come. For those that are not married, I pray, Lord, that what they've heard today, they would be able to share with other people that are having marriage problems throughout the weeks. In Jesus' name I pray.